chapter 5, 12, 13, 14. We're going to get into this uh, here in just a moment. And so uh, next week we'll, we'll do the rest of the chapter and then we'll finish up this part of Romans. And um, let's pray and then we'll get, we'll get into it. God, thank you for your word and thank you for the gospel and the, the, the truth of the gospel, the, the price that was paid for our salvation. When we were lost, that you still loved us and that you sent your son to die for us. And thank you that we can live in that truth and that we are secure and that we um, God, that we can rest in your provisions for us. God, as we look at this passage, and it's all about sin. God, help us to see our own sinfulness and how you are the only remedy for that. And God, help us to put our confidence in you. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, in English literature, one of the great classic pieces of English literature is Paradise Lost by John Milton. Um, it's what we're going to call today's message, Paradise Lost. Next week is Paradise Regained. Um, so Paradise Lost, is, it's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a poem. Uh, you know, if, you, if, you just, if all you know is that it's an epic piece of, a classic piece of English literature, you may not even know it's a poem, right? Like you may not even know, you just, I just know I've heard of it. It's, it's there in history. Well, it's a... It's a poem that was written in, or first published rather, in 1667. And when he wrote it, he broke it up into ten books. Ten, he called them books, or ten sections. And it's, and it's, um, it is fascinating. Um, it's a type of poetry called blank verse, and it, blank verse has gone on to become the predominant. English, a, a form of English poetry. Uh, scholars have said, basically, by the blank verse basically is that it has regular metrical lines, but they don't rhyme, right? And so it's, you know, somebody to, to somebody who doesn't deal with poetry, are you like, hey, is that even poetry? If it doesn't rhyme, is it even poetry? Well, yeah, it, it is. And it's, it follows a meter. And um, so scholars have describe this as probably the most common, the most influential form that English poetry has taken since the 1500s. That's how common this type of poetry is. And one scholar estimated about three quarters of all English poetry is blank verse, like Paradise Lost. It wasn't the first, but it is one of the most influential. It's considered to be John Milton's masterpiece. And um, it helped to solidify his reputation as one of the great English poets of all time. One of the things I thought was interesting is that um, uh, he was largely blind by the time he wrote this, and so he dictated it. And it was his sisters, I think if I recall right, it was his sisters who took dictation and wrote it out for him as he simply recited this off. It, it's astounding, like, to be able to, to prove the mind to work that way, but his certainly did. Um, you know what the story of Paradise Lost is? It's, it's a story. It's a it's a narrative in poetic form. Anybody want to you know what the story of Paradise Lost is? Hey, Warner, did you start the camera? I did not. Good thing. The story of Paradise that'll be on the video if you watch. The story of Paradise Lost. It's the story of the fall. It's the story of the temptation of Eve. It's the story of Adam and sin entering the world. It's a biblical story. It's the story of their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. It's the story of the entrance of sin and death into the world. And just as John Milton's poem from the 1600s told the story of sin entering the world, today's text in Romans, it gives us the theological truth of the results of that sin entering the world. That we do live in a paradise lost. This is not how it was intended to be. Our lives are not as God intended them when He created man. This world is not as He intended it to be when He spoke it into existence. This is the world that we live in. 
And this is the condition that we are in. It truly is paradise lost. And so help us to understand this. Um, I want to frame the message today basically in four questions. Right? I'm going to ask and answer these four questions. One, where does sin come from? Why do I sin? What happens when I sin? And then what's the remedy for my sin? And so we're going to find all of that in these three verses, and most of it, frankly, in the first of these three verses. So let's read Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Paul writes this to the Christians in Rome. He says, therefore, and it is, therefore is all the stuff we've just been talking about, right, at beforehand. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So this is a... There's a lot packed into this, right? And so there's the doctrine of depravity or of original sin. We're probably not going to talk about it in those terms, but we're going to describe how sin entered the world. We're going to answer this. Where does sin come from? And what is it? And what what happens when I commit that sin? And why, why do I commit sin? And we're going to answer those things. And it's not a pretty picture, frankly. The first of those questions is where does sin come from? And so, what I mean by that is not, not some philosophical, you know, where does sin come from, but, but literally, <coughs> when did sin enter this world? Where did it come from? And Paul offers a one-word answer. Adam. Sin came into the world through Adam. Now, I think this is interesting. He didn't say sin came the, into the world through Eve and then Adam, even though Eve, strictly speaking, disobeyed first. He said that sin entered the world through Adam. And we'll get into why that matters here in a little bit. But, but, but one of the reasons I think he did is because Eve was deceived by the serpent. Adam, it seems, willingly ate of the fruit. And I, I've said this before. I'll say it many, many more times. You'll get tired of hearing it. Motive matters. <coughs> Right? Now, it, doesn't, it doesn't dismiss what he did. It was still sin. I'm not, I'm not saying she's without guilt. But I am saying that I think God judges us not just on the things that we do, but the motivation behind the things we do. Why do I think that? Well, because when Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when Jesus reinforced various individual laws out of the law of Moses, we'll take adultery, for instance, right? It was against the law. It was a sin to commit adultery. And Jesus said, no, no, no. <laughs> it's also a sin to have lust in your heart. In other words, if you have the motivation, you've committed sin. So your motive matters. And Adam's motivation was very different than Eve's. Sin entered the earth and entered this world that we live in through Adam. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. And that truth takes us back all the way to Eden. It takes us back to this paradise that just had Adam and Eve. And, and God had created Adam to be the overseer of all of creation. He, he, he tended the creation. He named the animals. Like he had authority. And he had power. He, he even was the one who named Eve. Adam was the head of the first family. And Hang on to that little nugget that Adam was the head of this family because that's going to matter here in a minute. God said to Adam and Eve, look, I put you in this paradise. I put you in this garden. You're welcome to anything in it. I want you to avail yourselves of anything in it. You want to eat any of the fruit you want to eat. You want to play with the animals. You want to build a home. Like Whatever it is you want to do, you do. Except... This one thing, there's this one tree, one, out of all the garden, one tree, don't eat the fruit of that tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, if you eat the fruit, you will die. It's a pretty straightforward 
instruction. You think that Adam would be happy in paradise? It seems he's not. He wants the one thing he cannot have. Does that sound like anybody you know? I, I know a guy that gets that way sometimes. I won't tell you who he is, but I bet you can figure it out. We, this is this is our nature, right? This is part of what it means to be human. Is we want the thing we can't have. He wants this fruit. We know the story. He's, he's in the garden. He's got everything good. The serpent tricks Eve. She brings it to Adam. He eats. It was through this deliberate choice that Adam made that sin entered the world. There's a... a a name and a word that we give this event, we call it the fall. He fell, Adam fell from a state of innocence to a state of guilt. He fell from life to death. In a very real sense, he fell from heaven to hell. There's no way to explain the world we live in without understanding to some degree or another the fall. Why is that? Because we don't live in the garden. Right? Why don't we live in the garden? Because of the fall. Why is there sin? Why do people get sick and die? Why is there violence? Why is there pick your fraud, anger, jealousy? Why are there these things, right? It's because of the fall. It's the only way this world that we live in, it's the only way it makes sense is if Adam fell. It doesn't excuse any of it, but it does help us understand why the world is the way it is today. Why can't we change our nature? Because by one man, sin entered into the world. That's where sin comes from. So the second question that leads us to is, okay, that's how sin entered into the world, but why do I sin? Why do you sin? And this is where we start to shift from theory and history and, and, and all of those things to, to make it personal. Right? Because we're going to not talk quite as much about Adam and more about me and more about you. This isn't the sin, you know, why do I sin? This isn't, I don't sin because Adam sinned. I sin because I sinned. Now look, sin entered the world through Adam. But we're talking about my life this week and your life this week. And the things you're going to say or do, the places you're going to go, or the same as me, right? The, the attitudes we're going to have, the reactions we're going to have, the anger, the ambivalence or whatever it is that's in a, that's that's wrong, it's simple, it's inappropriate, whatever it is, there's an answer to this question too though. And it really is not a complicated answer. It's right there on the surface. And and the answer is so simple it's easy to miss, right? We sin because we have a sin nature. We're born with this inner bent in us towards sin. Listen again to how Paul said it. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Listen to that. Because all sinned. By the way, listen to the way that is. I'm not, an, I, I'm not highly academic. You know that. I get by, but I'm not real smart. But I do know the difference between present tense and past tense. I think this is interesting. Paul, talking about everybody on earth throughout human history, says all sinned. That's past tense. How is that possible? I wasn't in the garden when, Paul, when Adam fell. I wasn't around when Paul wrote this. How, how is it possible that all sinned? Now, he didn't say that all sinned present tense. It's true that we do. And he didn't say that all are sinners. And again, that's true, we are, but that's not what he said. He's pointing back to an event in the past when everyone sinned. So here's how to make sense of that, right? 
Remember he said, because all sin, let's think of it in this kind of terms, right? In this kind of way of thinking. Because all sinned in Adam. It, it, it's back to the Garden of Eden. It's back to this moment when Adam ate the fruit and, and, and committed that sin. And, and in some way that I don't fully understand, I was there and you were there. Now he, he, here's... Here's what that means essentially, right? Is that this this that's this doctrine of original sin. That's this doctrine that we, we often call it federal headship, right? Adam was the federal head. Remember when I said that he was the head of that first family? This is what that means. It is when Adam sinned, you sinned. When Adam disobeyed, I disobeyed. When Adam fell, I fell. When Adam died, you died, right? It's, because he was the federal head of the human race, when he did these things, they, they effectively happened to all of us below him. It, it, some ways to illustrate that to make it make sense, because in, in a sense, that doesn't make sense to me, right? In a way, that's just like, I don't know, John, this sounds a little bit like some mumbo-jumbo that's a uh, thing you're getting to. It, Adam was created and he was the representative of the whole human race. And what happened to him happened to all of us because he was appointed to act in the place of everyone who would come after him. If Adam was driving the bus of humanity, right? So you got Adam driving the bus, you got humanity in the bus with him. If Adam takes the bus off the cliff, all of humanity goes off the cliff with him. Right? It, it, if Adam is flying the plane and he crashes the plane, the guy in the back row is just as crashed. Adam took us all with him. And that's what this idea of federal headship means. There was a tennis player in the uh, mid to late uh, 1900s, way back, you know, way back. Arthur Ashe. Probably heard of him. He was. Uh, he, he played professionally from 69 or 70 to about 1980 and was one of the great tennis players of all time and the first really great African American tennis player to, to, to achieve greatness publicly, right? So he was a quiet man. He, he, he served the causes of justice and hope. He was a good man. He, he also, by the way, had a credible testimony as a follower of Christ, but you know, do you remember how Arthur Ashe died? He died of pneumonia caused by AIDS or AIDS-related pneumonia. Now, here's the thing, he had gotten he had contracted HIV through a blood transfusion during a heart bypass surgery about a decade or so before his death. Not his fault. He had bad genes that clogged up his heart. He had surgery, had a blood transfusion. For blood transfusion, this is before, um, you know, blood was screened in the ways that it is now. Nobody knew it. He didn't know it. The doctors didn't know it. It wasn't intentional, but it was just as real. When they pumped that blood into him, it contained this virus. He got bad blood. And for several years, about five or six years, he was okay. 1988, they discovered he was HIV positive and nothing could be done about it. And eventually, the disease that he contracted through this tainted blood took his life. When Adam fell, in a sense, he tainted the blood of humanity. We all inherit this. This virus of sin is something we all carry. Even babies born into this world are tainted with this sin virus, so to speak. That's why Romans 5, it's what Romans 5.12 tells us, right? Every person is born with this tendency to do wrong and born with a sin nature. And it's easy to see this with little children. When it comes to children, there's a lot of things that you have to teach them. Like you have to you teach them and they learn from you how to talk and how to walk and to tie their shoes and to whatever, right? All the things that you teach a child. 
But you don't ever have to teach a child how to do wrong. You don't ever have to teach a child how to lie or how to disobey or how to pitch a fit or how to be selfish. Right? You don't. It is hardwired into them. It's hardwired into you and me too. We don't outgrow that. They're born knowing these things. There's a one prominent preacher, he put it this way. Listen, this is funny, it's on point, and it's sad all the same time. He said, people who don't believe in original sin don't have children. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's not a little angel. That's a diaper in a diaper. <laughs> the angry cry happens early. The demanding cry happens early. The stiffening up of the body happens early. It's so cute. That ain't cute. One of the reasons God makes them so small is so that they won't kill you. One of the reasons He makes them so cute is so that you won't kill them. And, and there's a little facetiousness in there, but is He not pretty spot on? started with Adam, it didn't end there. It continues in my life and in your life. This Adam was the first sinner. He was not the last. We follow in the footsteps of our forefather because we share his blood. We, we, looked, at some, we looked at where sin comes from why and why you and I sin. The third question is even more practical. What happens when I sin? That is, what's the result? What, what's the ultimate result of sin? Where does it lead? And again, the passage is clear and the answer is simple, right? It's another one word answer. It leads to death. When I sin, I die. In fact, in a sense, again, I don't, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but in a sense, every time I sin, I die a little. And every time you sin, you die a little. We sin because we think it brings us something good, right? Some kind of peace, some kind of happiness, some kind of fulfillment, some kind of something. But all it brings us is bondage and death. Again, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. First there was sin, then there was death. It's just the way the world works. It, it, Verse 14, it is interesting. It says death reigned basically between Adam and Moses, like between Adam's sin and the law. Death reigned, it said. What does that mean? It means that even before the Ten Commandments, even before the law came, men sinned and they died because of their sin. That the law hadn't been given, how did they... Genesis 5, we see it. It's the first great sort of genealogical list in the Bible. There's these generations from Adam to Moses. Each one ends the same. Adam lived, he died. Seth lived, he died. Enosh lived, Kenan lived, and he died. The, you know, generation after generation, Enoch being the one exception who was taken up to heaven without seeing death. But the rest, they lived sometimes hundreds and hundreds of years, but then they died. The point is, is that even without the law, people died because of their sin. They died as sinners. Romans 14, or 5 14 says that they sinned even though they never broke a specific command. They still sinned. The commands hadn't even been given yet. There was sin in the world before there was law. The presence of death before the law was given is it, it, proof of that. Death reigned in those first generations of human history, but here's the thing, death reigns today. So open up the eagle if you can find one. Open up the eagle to the sorry, little social commentary thing, little local local commentary. Open up the eagle or whatever your paper of choice to the obituary section. Go to every funeral home website, uh, the funeral websites of every funeral home in town, right? Go to the, they all list their obituaries. And there's just name after name after name. Why? Because death reigns. Death reigns for us too. Um, 
if there's one thing that we can be absolutely certain of, it's that there is a one-to-one -one re relationship between life and death. If a person lives, they will die. Without exception, unless Jesus comes first. The old saying that nothing is as certain as death and taxes, but the reality is, is there's lots of people who get away without paying their taxes. Nobody escapes the end. How, how certain is this fact? Well, it's so certain the entire life industry, life insurance industry is built on it, right? Just think about that for a second, right? You buy life insurance because someday you're going to die. If you live forever, you're going to need life insurance. But if you, should you buy it precisely because you know that you will die, but you don't know when you'll die. So you pay all this money, but in order to get the benefit, you have to die. If you live and you don't die, you lose, right? You waste to spend all this money and you, you, you lose. But you you live, you die, somebody else collects it, right? You still lose, right? Like it's a whole industry built on this on this surety. The death reigns. When we die, somebody's going to fill out a death certificate. When you die, somebody's going to fill out a death certificate for you. And there's a place on it. And I've seen a lot of death certificates. There's a place on it. And it's the cause of death. Right? And, and they're going to put some medical condition or natural causes. But I'm going to tell you what they, if it were completely honest and biblical, they could pre-fill that and pre print every one of those. What's the cause of death? Sin. For every one of us. Ultimately not sickness, ultimately not cancer, ultimately not old age, ultimately not an accident. Ultimately the cause of all of our demise will be sin. The other things are just symptoms. And that leads to the fourth and final question. What's the remedy? Paul does this. He did this earlier in Romans where he set up the problem. He set up the situation. He set up the condition, and then he comes in with the answer, the solution. Well, he's doing it again. Now, we're not going to... The, the answer to this is simple, right? What's the remedy for my sin? Again, these have all been simple answers to these questions. The remedy is that we need the gift of God. We talked about Paradise Lost. I mentioned that next Sunday, we're going to look at the rest of Romans 5. If you want to read ahead and, and think about what that says, uh, to kind of prepare your heart and mind, that would be wonderful. We're going to talk about paradise regained. In just a few minutes, we're going to receive communion. We're going to do this together. Before we do, and help us prepare our hearts for that. I'm going to take just a minute to answer this last question. What's the remedy for my sin? It's the gift of God. And I'm going to dip my toe a little bit into next week's text, but we'll go through it more thoroughly next week. Verse 15, which we did not read, says that the gift of God is not like the trespass. Think about that for a moment. Adam committed a sin and brought death into the world. The gift of God, it's something different. It's not like the trespass. And then... He goes on in verse 16. He makes a similar comment. He says, Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. In fact, in, in the first little paragraph of, of the rest of this chapter, verses 15, 16, 17, Paul mentions the gift five times. I want to share a great theological truth. It's a great hermeneutical truth. Truth, it's a great like this is a great Bible study truth. So so when something is mentioned in scripture in fairly short in fairly short succession, something's mentioned repeatedly, there's a good chance that's important. It's kinda like kinda like when your parents or your teacher or somebody would tell you the same thing over and over, right? We've got a couple of three got three teachers in the room right now. This scares me a little bit. We got three teachers in the room, and I know all of you, if you repeat something, and sometimes you even say, You hear me repeat this, right? I'm going to tell you again. In other words, you'll hear this again. This is going to show up on a test. This is important information. Whatever however it is that, that frames in your context, right? When when you hear something repeated in scripture, pay attention. 
because it's going to come back. It's important. Five times in three verses, Paul mentions the gift of God. What's the gift? What's he talking about? We don't have to wonder. He Keep reading. He describes it. He defines this for you. He gives us four definitions. He talks about the gift of God, the gift of grace, the gift of righteousness, and the gift of eternal life. But really, it's even more simple than that. Romans 5.15 says that this gift came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Get that? The one man. Remember, this is the, this is the contrast Paul is making, right? He, today is paradise lost. One man sent through one man centered at sin entered into the world and death through sin. Next week we're going to see that through one man we're offered redemption. We're given this gift of grace through the one man, Jesus Christ. God's gift of eternal life comes to you and to me through the one man, through Jesus Christ. Well, how did He do that? He did that. He did that with this act that we're going to commemorate now where He came he lived this sinless life and he died a death he didn't deserve. And just like the prophets of the Old Testament foretold, his body was broken and his blood was spilled on our behalf. For you and for me. He erased the curse that Adam brought into this world. And he doesn't erase it completely until He returns. But He erases the curse individually for us. We have eternal life when we trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. We trust in His life, death, burial, and resurrection for us. And so, I want us to bow our heads and we're going to take just a moment Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians, he instructs the church to not take uh, the Lord's Supper, to not take communion unworthily. And so I'm going to give you a chance if there's anything in the way right now, if there's anything between you and God, if there's any, you have conflict with someone else, you, you need to ask forgiveness. I, I want to give you a chance to pray for your accounts between you and God. That you can receive the symbolically the body and blood of Christ in a worthy manner. Then I'll distribute the elements and we will uh, hold them up, hold on to them, we'll take them together. Will you bow your heads with me, please? God, thank you for your love for us. sin and our lostness you came to redeem us you sent your son to die for us to reverse the curse of Adam to reverse the effects of sin and death and hell and the grave so that we could experience eternal life with you we thank you God for this broken body and this shed blood for, for us and we thank you for these this bread and this cup that represent that. God, we know that these are mere symbols, but God, help us to see them. Help us to see them for what they symbolize, for the price that was paid for us. God, forgive us our sins. We are, we are selfish. We have tempers. Sometimes we don't tell the truth. Sometimes we don't treat people <clears throat> rightly. God, I pray that you forgive us of that. Help us to treat our brothers and sisters with love and with compassion. Help us to treat the world around us with love and compassion. But God, help us to rest solely on you to find our confidence in you. 
ask it in Jesus' name.